Welcome back to another episode of the Prolific Super Producer Podcast, where we are here, where you're in your corner as fellow bedroom producers, dare we say, dare we dare we be that confident? Yes, we are that confident. We're here. We're talking on the microphone. We want to help you in your music journey. If you're someone that is making songs in your bedroom and you have dreams for them, right? You want to get them streaming. You want to get them like, maybe you want to play them live someday. We just want to be in your corner. We want to help you get to that point to get to finished songs. And speaking of finished songs, we like to kind of like give things away. We're just like helping fellow musicians, fellow creators. Creators. So if you're struggling to finish your songs, like this is a massive key, you could binge all these episodes and you're going to get some fire advice. But if you don't have finished songs to actually do anything with, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. So if you're struggling with some writer's block, I've got a free guide for you. If you head to finishsongsguide.com, completely free guide. It's going to walk you through a system to make a song in five steps, start to finish the whole thing. So what's really cool too, and you like have all these half finished projects, you can plug any of them into the system, pick up a step two or three, finish it all out, and you're going to start pumping out finished songs. And the more songs you finish is the more at bats you have to actually do some stuff in this music world that you really want to, that you know you're capable of. Okay. So finishsongsguide.com to get a copy of that again, completely free. So Tyson, what are we talking about today, man? We're talking about how to learn anything fast, how to learn things, right? And so we're going to be talking about a very simple framework of how to actually learn things extremely quickly in music and be able to master any skill that you need to in your current trajectory, whatever you're trying to learn right now, whether it's mixing, whether it's songwriting, whether it's production, anything in music, you can use this simple framework to learn. And this is not just like something that is our opinion. It is actually based in science, um, mostly based on the book, The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg and also Atomic Habits by James Clear. Both of those work hand in hand to build habits, which therefore build skills in whatever you're trying to learn. Because ultimately, a skill is just a collection of habits that we stack on top of one another to then achieve a given result. So if that sounds super sciencey for you, we'll break it all down <laughs> and make sure it's really easy for you to actually implement in your everyday life. I'm very excited about this because I've been working on this kind of framework to teach people mixing for a really long time. And I think I've finally like kind of cracked the code essentially of how to learn mixing specifically really, really fast, but it can definitely be applied to any skill you're trying to learn in music. To start this off, I want to break one core belief that if you still believe this, you will actually not be able to utilize this framework at all. And so I want to start out by telling you a story about Zach Hambrick. So Zach Hambrick was, is currently today a professor in his neurology and psychology of some sort, but uh, he's a super smart professor guy at MSU. And but when he was in high school, he didn't want to be a professor. He wanted to be a pro golfer. So he decided he had learned that to master anything, you needed to put in 10,000 hours to master that skill. So he decided, OK, that's easy. If I just put in the time, I'll be great at golf. And so he decided to then put in all his energy into golf. And throughout his high school years and, and late <laughs> teens, <laughs> he decided that he was going to put in his 10,000 hours in golf. So he did this. He went out to the golf course every single day on the driving range, on the putting green, working on his skill of playing golf. But then he soon found out that even though he was putting in way more time than some of his peers, his peers were still out golfing him in all the tournaments. Mm. He was still not a very good golfer. And ultimately, he never even made it to college to play golf for any collegiate team because he wasn't very good. This fundamental belief of if I just put in the time, I will be great at something is in fact not true. Ooh. Zach Hambrick has now, since that experience, dedicated his life to understanding how to learn things because mm. of his early on failure of trying to learn how to be a pro golfer. All of this said, just because you do something for a very long time does not necessarily mean that you will be great at it. I've, I've heard again and again from various people why they've put in so much time into a certain skill, but yet they're still not very good at it. And ultimately, it comes back to the habits that you form. So I'm going to take you through the cycle of virtuous learning and also vicious degradation. So there's two <laughs> cycles here that you can go on. And ultimately, Zach Hambrick chose the cycle of vicious degradation of his skill of golfing. And so I'll break that all down for you. But before I do, Nathan, do you have anything to add before I dive into those? I was just going to say like almost how f it, maybe it's a little freeing. And it's a little frustrating if you're hearing that, right? Like, because how often are we heard or consuming things about how to make it a music, how to do whatever, how to it, really any sphere, just grind. I mean, that 
phrase. I've heard it so many times now. It like irritates me. Like grind, hustle, just work hard. And it's like how that's the recipe. I think it's like part of the recipe. You know what I mean? If you're thrown in different ingredients to make something, yeah, hard work, hustle, grinding, that's in there. You have to have that. Absolutely. But I think we confuse that like being an ingredient as like the main recipe. And especially like you're saying, it's not just that you're working hard. It's how are you working? How are you practicing? So I think there's just levels of nuance there that for me, I'm hearing you say that and I'm like, oh, okay, that's kind of freeing because it's not just in grinding it out for 10 years. Okay, cool. So I don't have to do that. But then it can be frustrating if someone's listening and they've just been working really hard and they feel like they're not any further than they were 10 years ago, seven years ago, three years ago, right? Listen up. Tyson broke this down for me as we were, you know, prepping for this episode for y'all. And this is awesome stuff. I would like whip out a notepad, whatever. Just make sure you mark this like time period in the podcast. This is some really powerful stuff to help you in your music journey as you are practicing and working hard the right way. I would actually add on to that too. I was that person who just thought he had oh, to same. work really hard yes. to, yeah. to get to get somewhere. And so if that is you, don't feel discouraged. Yeah. Be super glad that you're listening to this episode because it's going to totally break that barrier for you. And you'll be able to really do the right things to learn the right skills to then move your career forward in music. Yes. Because I, I was stuck here for years just thinking, oh, I just need to get in my reps, which there is an aspect of that, which we're going to break down. But there's also this aspect of if you're not doing the right things and you're not doing it the mm-hmm. right way, then you're not actually improving improving your skills, you're just making it more permanent. So with mm-hmm. that, let's dive in. And if you have a piece of paper, as Nathan mentioned, make sure you're writing this down because this is super powerful stuff and it will change your life as it changed mine. <laughs> um, the very first step of this cycle, there's four main steps and it is cue, craving, response, reward. Okay, those are the four steps. And this is directly from the uh, Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. This is how humans form habits. And the cue just brings breaking down these terms here for us so we can understand what we're talking about. The cue is anything that is put in front of us that appears to us to be a problem. So for example, if I'm mixing a song and I have a vocal that is really muddy. Then all of a sudden, that is a cue to me. I'm hearing it and I'm thinking, okay, that's a problem. Now I have, I'm going to develop the next step, which is craving. The craving is going to be, I want to fix that vocal because I want it to sound nice and crispy and professional. I don't want it to sound muddy in my mix. And so now I have a craving of, okay, now I need to fix this thing and I'm going to do something. I'm going to try to have a response, which is the next step to then fix that problem that exists. Backing up, muddy vocal is the cue. The craving is, I want to fix this muddy vocal. The response is now I'm going to add an EQ to this vocal. And this is where things get interesting because if I don't know how to mix very well, for example, I might just put a high pass filter all the way up to like 600 Hertz. If you understand what I just said, that's going to make my vocal sound really, really harsh and it's going to have zero low end. So now my vocal is not muddy, but it's also not warm. It's also not full. It's just it sounds really harsh and it's just all top end information. So it's gonna sound terrible, but the issue is, is it fixed my muddy vocal? So that is in and of itself, some sort of reward. Also, I noticed a change in the vocal, which also rewards my, you know, reward centers in my brain saying, you did a good thing. You can see how all of a sudden this cycle gets really negative really fast because the issue is if I do this enough times, that's going to become my automatic response response to a muddy vocal. I'm always going to high pass it up to 600 hertz. And if I just don't know any better and I don't really realize what I'm doing, then I'm going to automatically do that every single time I have this muddy vocal, ultimately going to become my habit that I do every single time. And ultimately, I'm always going to end up with harsh, nasty vocals in my mixes. So this, what I've just outlined is the vicious cycle of degradation, because what happens really fast is if you stack all of these habits on top of one another, that you're just doing the wrong things inside of your mix, or you're doing the wrong things when you're writing melodies, or you're doing the wrong things when you're producing a song, you're automatically going to do those wrong things to end up with a bad result. And trust me, I was here for years in them, in my, especially in my mixes, I was doing the wrong things and I was making those things permanent. And so I just didn't even know any better that I was doing the wrong things. I feel very targeted as you're talking right now. (laughs) 
<laughs> or even here's a worse cue and then craving. Honestly, man, it, it, I'm just saying this to be super vulnerable. Maybe someone else gets it. Like you bought a new plugin and it was nice and shiny or it was by that mixing engineer that you really look up to and you love what they do. And you're like, I can be just like them. But the cue, right? You've got the vocal or you've got the drum, the kick drum or whatever, and it's not thick. So my cue or the cue is there, right? My craving is I want to fix it. What am I going to do? My response, the shiny new plugin that I got. Even if like that's not what I should do at all. <laughs> it's just like my response becomes this weird response of, oh, the flashy thing will fix it. And I think that's part of the whole plug-in talk, which maybe we should say for another day. But I'm just connecting the dots now like, yo, oh my goodness. It's the cue. I want my music to sound better. My vocals to sound crispy. My drums to hit harder. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, I want to fix it. The fancy thing will do it. I spent $200 yeah. on this plug-in. This one will do it. You know, And it's like you just slap it on and you're not even thinking. Yeah. This is, yeah. It's... <laughs> I, I didn't mean to get you fired up. Yeah. But th this is really quick thing that I do want to add on here though because the other cues that could be occurring are not necessarily as obvious as I have a muddy vocal. The mm. cues could be I'm insecure and I want to feel more secure. So if I'm insecure about my mix and I'm like, eh, it's not, doesn't sound full. I also had this craving to fill that hole in my life of I feel insecure with my mix and I'm going to then try to fix my insecurity by doing something. And so I'm then going to use this fancy plugin that in and of itself is a reward because yes. people People spend thousands of dollars, if not tens of yes. thousands of dollars, making these plugins look really good. I'm going to I'm going to need a second, Tyson. I, I'm going to need a second, man. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> like if I didn't feel targeted before. Because that plugin looks cool and you feel yes. good using it. Yeah. That in and of itself is a reward, which causes you to create this habit response of every single time I have the, any insecurity in my mix, I'm going to reach for these fancy plugins yes. to make myself feel better. You fast forward a few years, oh, in the same spot. You're not actually fixing the yes. issues. You're just simply using fancy plugins that you spent way too much money on to do the same exact thing that your default stock plugins would have done, mm. but they just look cooler and so you <laughs> think that they sound better. Yes. And last point here, <laughs> when you're mixing, most of the time you'll actually get better data if you close your eyes. If you don't see anything, your body inherently will use your ears more than mm -hmm. your eyes yes. and you will actually mix and make better decisions inside of your mix. All of these fancy plugins could actually be hindering your ability to actually get a good mix because they look fancy. Yeah. The fancier they look, the actually the less you hear. That, that's a whole nother conversation. And so maybe we'll have that another day, but moving on. But this just made me think, okay, so we've cut like the mixing side, you know, engineering side and production side, a little bit of all this cue craving response reward to speak out to like the songwriting side of this. This is why I'm so passionate. And I have the guide that I have for free is finished songs in five steps. I'm so passionate about people finishing songs because I struggled with this and I realized I had a cue craving response reward system around not finishing songs. This is a whole thing too. If you're not finishing songs, it may not be so much the tactical chord structure or song structure, melodies for the chorus, transition. It may not be that stuff. Like it might just be you have a, you know, your cue is like it gets difficult and so you stop. <laughs> like that's what it was for me. You know, like I'm making a song and I'm like, oh, I got a cool vibe, got a cool music. Music, maybe got some gibberish melody. I don't know where to take the song. So my response was, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna work on it anymore. You have this hard drive of songs that are piling up because of the habits. You, you've changed your habits to identify of someone who does not finish songs. You identify as someone who is a demo master. And so that's how you behave. Instead of choosing, no, I finish what I start. I write full songs. Now you behave differently. That was just like a whole thing that... No, 100%. And I think that that goes on with this conversation extremely well, because not only are you being rewarded by basically leaning away from what's uncomfortable, you're mm -hmm. being rewarded again because the initial idea for you was really easy to come up with. And mm -hmm. so then you're going to be rewarded again for creating something new, yes. but yes. then not actually finishing it. Yeah. So there, it's like you, ha you have these competing habits, right, that are all going to give you rewards or struggles. And inherently, as humans, we don't like to put forth effort. Mm -hmm. And so the least amount of effort I can put forward and still get a reward, I'm yes. going to do. And so which is why, you know, bad habits like smoking or whatever is 
so easy to do because it's really easy to light a cigarette and smoke versus yes. actually face whatever else is going on in my life that's difficult that I don't actually want to. So yeah. it's this process of rewiring rewiring our brains mm-hmm. in order to do the action that will actually move us forward in our lives in whatever capacity that is. With that, let's move over to actually how to make this a virtuous cycle yes. of learning rather than the vicious cycle of degradation. How do we fix it? This The process is relatively the same, but obviously instead of moving in a downward spiral, we want to move this in an upward spiral. So instead of just in, increasingly making permanent bad or habits that are bad inside of our process of making music, we want to make them better. But there's one additional step that we need to add to the process in order to make sure that that happens. The cue is the same, our muddy vocal inside of our mix. And then we have a craving to fix that vocal, right? It's the same exact thing as the last time. And then we have a response. Let's say that we still don't do a very good job and we just high pass that all the way up to 600 hertz. All of a sudden, our vocal is now harsh, have this new problem. In our old cycle, we just moved on because we fixed the issue that we had heard initially. But instead, we want to insert a step here, and that is getting feedback. And feedback could be multiple sources. The easiest low hanging fruit that you could do here is use a reference track inside of your mix. That is initial feedback, even though it's not a person telling you, hey, your vocal sounds like crap now you need to go fix it like yeah. add some low end back into it don't high pass it that high uh just you know maybe cut some of your 300 hertz in your vocal and it'll yes. sound it'll fix your muddy muddiness but still keep the warmth and the nice you know whatever other qualities that you want in your vocal. And so this feedback though, even if you don't have somebody like me there to tell you do this instead, you can listen to your reference song and you can say, okay, now what does their vocal sound like? What does my vocal sound like? Is there Mm -hmm. any like obvious difference here that is not good, right? Because that brings you back to this objective truth of what a vocal should sound like. Yes. Especially if you're using multiple references, which I highly recommend. Use two or three references in your mix so you can bounce back and forth. There are subjective changes inside of your mixing, but if you reference multiple things, you can get a baseline of like, okay, this is generally how vocals should sound. Yes. And if my vocal does not sound like that, then I know that I need to make a change to make it better. And what this does is it inserts this little tiny cycle (laughs) inside (laughs) of the larger cycle of the four steps. Because now you're going down to finally this step of having response and then before you move on to the reward essentially you have this feedback cycle and then the feedback cycle then gives you feedback if you have a negative feedback then you go back to the action or the response Mm. and then you do it again and then you go to the feedback cycle again and you say okay did i do this better (laughs) and once you finally get some positive feedback of yes my vocal sounds closer to my reference I like how it's sounding now now I get positive feedback then that's the reward ultimately yes it takes a little longer to get there all of a sudden now I've gone from making a really dumb decision in my mix to Mm -hmm. making a strategic objective objectively good decision in my mix that's actually moving my mix forward in the right direction of where I'm trying to go so having this feedback in all its various forms right we can extrapolate this to an entire mix too. So after you're done with your mix, say you you send it over to me and I give you mix critique, Mm -hmm. then all of a sudden that is going to be feedback on the entire process. So while it's not as immediate as say a reference track, it's still very valuable for you to improve your process. And if you're doing this consistently over time, constantly getting feedback, constantly improving how you're doing things in order to more closely match your goals, then all of a sudden Mm. you're increasing your skill, you're increasing your habitual responses yes. to issues that in your music to then ultimately end up with a way more professional sounding result. Huge. Oh my goodness. It makes me think of this uh, quote from Napoleon Hill. He's like something, I'm paraphrasing, something to the effect of, you don't control your future, you control your habits and your habits control your future, right? Like your, your habits determine what you're going to do. So like, I just love this. This is, this is like next level stuff. This is next level stuff that no one talks about. Everyone is giving you the game of the EQ plugin, the, you know, songwriting hack. I'm I'm doing that too. Like I, I've made videos about how to make melodies easier. You know what I mean? And that's all has its place, but this is that next level stuff that I think I trust all the pros, people who are actually doing this and making money from this stuff consistently. They've done this rewiring. They've like they've they've figured out this whole habit thing, even if maybe they couldn't point to that and say, that's 
it, I don't think you could help but say like, hey, they, they identify as a pro. I'm going to behave like a pro and I'm not going to take shortcuts. And now all of a sudden it changes the approach to how I'm mixing something, how I'm writing something, how I finish something. And so I think this is just super powerful. Like, thank you for breaking this down for us, Tyson. It was like so helpful. For my own career and my own journey in music, this was like the missing link mm -hmm. that ultimately started moving me in the right direction. Like it's not immediate. As you can tell, like this yeah. process takes time. Like you need to figure out ways to get feedback. You yeah. need to gather that feedback. If I didn't have people in the industry, pros that I trusted to be able to send my music to, yeah. I would not be where I am today. And so part of it is finding those collaborator, uh, collaborators for your music, those industry pros that you trust, and ultimately getting that good feedback so that you can improve your improve yourself over time because I don't know anybody who was who has actually done something of note mm. in music or otherwise who didn't have some sort of mentor or yeah. Gandalf or yes. you know equivalent character in their lives yes. guiding them to what was actually great. I've had multiple mentors in my life that have in small and big ways like spoken into my skill as a producer mm -hmm. engineer and moved me along that journey much faster. The last thing that I want to mention if you want to shortcut this as much as possible, not only do you have to get quality feedback, and that's mm -hmm. another thing I didn't really mention, quality feedback, because you can get good feedback point. from your spouse or your girlfriend yeah. or your partner, and they're probably not going to give you very good feedback. The reason being is they are going to value your relationship yeah. over the feedback. 100%. So they value you more than your music, which is a good thing. Which is, that's how it should be, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you also need to recognize that they're not going to be 100% honest with what they actually think about your music. Yeah. So you need to go outside of that circle. Yeah. You need to be willing to be vulnerable with somebody who is not afraid to offend you because yes. ultimately that's really what's going to make the difference in moving you forward in your career. Yeah. That being said, the other way to shortcut this whole process is to start from a better response cycle. So what I mean by that is if I have no idea what an EQ is and I am faced with a muddy vocal, I might try any number of things to try to fix this vocal. Mm -hmm. I might try adding compression. I might try adding a saturator. I could add some distortion. Like yeah. I, there's any number of things that I could do to try to fix this issue. And ultimately I really just needed an EQ, but not knowing that knowledge, not having the knowledge of what's going to actually fix this issue, set me at a disadvantage where I'm going to have to go through that feedback cycle 15 times before I finally realize, oh, I just need to use an EQ and I need to use this EQ in this way yeah. to fix this vocal. Yeah. Basically having a baseline of knowledge is extremely helpful. The reason why I didn't really talk about this earlier is that most of us, I would say, especially in music, don't have this issue. Normally, we have way more knowledge <laughs> than we do actual execution power. Yeah. And so really, we just need to iterate on the skills, on the knowledge that we have to either make that knowledge permanent, if it's the right knowledge, or yeah. just get feedback until we actually refine that knowledge till it's actually usable in our process. Yes. If you want a shortcut on your mixing process, then I've created a course for you. It's free course. So you can go in, log in, take it, gain knowledge from it, and ultimately have the foundation you need to go out and actually utilize what you've learned in this episode to improve your mixing skills very rapidly. This is just the fundamental foundational stuff that's going to set that awesome foundation for you to grow up and build your skyscraper in your mixing skill extremely quickly. You can go get that course at promixformula.com. That is pro mixformula.com and that will redirect you to where you can get this course for free. Again, this is my free gift to you for listening to this podcast, engaging with us, and ultimately, I really hope it helps you with your journey of getting more professional music. If you want us to talk about something specific, if you're struggling with something today and you desperately need help with it, then leave a review and also leave in your review what you actually want help with, whether it's more mixing knowledge, whether it's how to master your song, whether it's how to write killer melodies, how to make content for artists, anything yes. that has to do with music, let us know in your review and then we will prioritize that in more episodes in the future. So thanks for watching and listening and we will see you in the next one.